Here are his objectives. My goal is that they may be, first of all, in ready courage, in heart, and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. So we picked out in colour the important words there. Just as he has renounced secret and shameful ways in covering up for his God-glorifying acknowledgement of his own goodness, Paul is equally open about what he is trying to do with these folks as he writes to them. He's not manipulating them. Do you see the point? We have renounced secret and shameful ways. He knows the damage heresy does. I'm trying to talk you out of that, he says. It's damaging. And if I can talk you out of that, the result, the effect of that, is you're going to be encouraged in heart, and united in love, and your understanding is going to grow, so that you may know the mystery of God, namely of Christ. Here's my agenda. See, he's put away all confidence in the flesh, and he's put away all secret and shameful, manipulative ways that are often recommended as the way to go and do church growth or church planting. And he says, here's what I'm doing. It's in the shop window. What was he up against in, in court? Was it Agrippa? Yeah, the grip it wasn't it. And the grip says, You try to persuade me to become a Christian. He says, Yeah, I want you to become a Christian. He said, Just as I am, exactly like me, except for these chains. Yeah, I do. I want you to become a Christian. I'd love it. Would you become a Christian? I'd love you to become a Christian. That'd be great. I've renounced, he says, secret and shameful ways. It's all in the shop window. I know, he says, the damage heresy does. It is not just a matter of sharing different opinions with me. This proto-Gnostic heresy in Colossae was discouraging the people. It was fracturing the unity they should have had in Christ. It was destroying their understanding. It was hindering, harming their personal knowledge of Christ. Heresy is not an alternative opinion. Heresy is harmful. You expect your pastor to be tough on it here. People come along and they cannot, professing to be Christian, and they cannot accept biblical truth, they will be encouraged to accept biblical truth. And you know what happens next, don't you? They get the hump. And they go away. Or, they actually do want to take God's word as authoritative. And we help them as lovingly as we can to see things this way. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. Those who wish to embrace heresy, where the truth sounds hard to take, are going to make all sorts of noises about the unkindness, the unchristianness of those who take their stand for the gospel and the furtherance of God's purposes. You'll be the baddie. Paul struggles. Remember? But the effect of heresy is that the people of God get their chins down. The unity of the people of God, which is what the gospel is there to do in the eternal plan and purpose of God, is broken. So the gospel is fundamentally subverted by this disunity that this heresy brings into the church. Does that make sense? And again, because you look at it as if you're enough, actually. That's gone, yeah. Okay. The eternal plan and purpose of God is to bring everything together again under the headship of Christ, to mend his broken world through bringing people to Jesus. Yeah, that's a very short story, isn't it? But that's the story. Now, heresy brings discord into the church of God. It destroys the unity that the gospel is there to bring about. Not just for the church, but for the cosmos. How damaging, how, how bad is heresy? It's jolly bad, isn't it? It strikes at subverting the whole purpose of God in church and in gospel. I want you to be encouraged as well. My goal in sharing this open struggle with you, my goal in that is that you might be encouraged in heart. Who, who doesn't respond well to encouragement? It's a real question. Who is it that doesn't respond well to encouragement? Well, it's generally people who are overcome with pride. It's people who think they're the top dog. So you go out encouraging me. It's quite fun. Look, this is a little spectator sport. Don't tell anybody, okay? But <laughs> go along to a minister's conference and find a senior man. And find something basic and simple and encouraging to say to him. See what happens next. 
It's a great spectator sport. And you'll know what's inside. You'll know what's inside. Because the guy who wants to be the top dog can't accept encouragement from the lowly. The people who want to be top dog that are afflicting the church in Colossae will never accept encouragement. Encouraging normal people lifts them up, but the top dog tends to see encouragement as an affront to his pride. How dare you encourage me, you lowly person! See? Don't ask me for names, but I tell you that's a great sporting conference. Now think this all through, because you won't find any of this in books, and I'm, I'm just letting you know that, says Paul, I'm, I'm persisting in struggling for, for you, even though I, I've never seen you. In order, first of all, to encourage you. You've been damaged, you've been hurt by these prognostic supremacists who are trying to jack themselves up with their talk of esoteric knowledge and experience and superiority, superior knowledge. I'm laying it all open before you, but my struggles, my perseverance for you, because I want to see you strengthened against these big harmful things by gaining encouragement from seeing the struggles I have on your behalf. Encourage in heart, united in love. We know why. We know why, because that's the, that's the eternal plan and purpose of God, to bring unity together again under the headship of Christ in a broken world. We know, we know that's the way it is. The third objective is to convey understanding. Understanding. In the Bible, theological truth conveys understanding, not just knowledge. Understanding on which Christian life is built. On which Christian unity is built. And the Bible, the source of that understanding, is knowledge. How far have we got? Not knowledge in the Gnostic sense, some supremacist, superior knowledge. This is the personal knowledge of God. It is knowing the mystery of God, not the proto-Gnostic mysteries. The mystery of God, and that's all about Jesus. Now, please get that clear. It is in Jesus, not in some teacher, some proto-Gnostic teacher or any other teacher, that all the riches of wisdom and knowledge are found. It's not in the preacher. It's in Jesus. People look in all sorts of religious corners for what Jesus alone can give them, but he's not in those corners. You don't find Jesus in odd corners. You find that, isn't it? You find him in the public square. He's in the public place. Out in the marketplace. Out in the public square. Why does Paul open his heart to them to strengthen them in this way? Because they need strengthening? Because they're vulnerable, vulnerable to what? Paul's dealt with his struggles, he's dealt with his objectives in verses 2 and 3, and now he's saying, I need to strengthen you for this purpose, verse 4. Here's my purpose. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding knowledge. 